Welcome to Monwa Recaps, spoilers ahead, watch out, and take care. Ludia is asking if Larson is coming back, but gets smacked with a hammer. Ludia says she just wants to go back to Larson, Ivelia tells her that he's only coming here to greet the patriarch. And he will be leaving immediately, so she might not see him. Ludia says no shot that'll happen. Ivelia asks what she means, and Ludia proudly says she is his best friend. Ivelia says that means nothing, and that family comes first. Ludia says she'll just become family, and that she can just get married to Larson. We hear Ivelia bonk her head, and barks at her. It jumps to Persia asking about Larson going on his pilgrimage. Then says that she wanted to cut all of his fingers off. And gets heated saying that he is lucky. Turns out she's in a temple surrounded by what we can assume are enemies. Then one of them starts to yell, saying that she stole Sylphia's wings and the ancient stone. And he will execute her in the name of Henker. One of them approach her, asking where the stone is. Sando steps up, but she just laughs at the man, taunting him. The man says she needs to get her last words out now. Persia says he has a nice arm, and he says those are some bad final words. She says it won't be as anymore, the man grabs her face then yeets her into a wall. One of the other men says the matons are nothing, the eye patch man tells them not to underestimate them. The man says the chief is tripping, then he looks down to see that he lost his arm privileges. He looks up to see Persia holding his arm, and she asks which part she should put up as decoration. The men shudder in fear, but some of them say not to fear boots and that it's just a couple of women. They all start to run in at Persia, she then tells Sando that if one of them touches her she will be the first to die. In the aftermath of them being off-screened, we see the chief crawling away. Saying he didn't know one of the maidens would be this strong. She effortlessly ripped them all apart, even though they are meant to be Henker's elite squad, she played with them like toys. He needs to quickly tell the others, but it's too late as he feels an ominous energy around his throat. His body begins to float into the air, and Persia takes the man's head away from his body. She disappointedly looks at it, saying it looked okay far away. But she realizes she was mistaken, then she asks if her brother's pilgrimage is over, she means Carlton. Sando asks if she wants to meet him, Persia says she's not interested in untalented insects. Then it cuts to Carlton standing above monster corpses, saying that he'll see Larson soon, then back to Persia saying it's frustrating that she can't do anything about Larson and she cannot let it be as it is, so she must prepare a gift for him. We hear Cassin asking what a pilgrimage is, and Larson telling him that he's going to travel the world for two years collecting artifacts and improving. Cassin says it's just training outside then, but asks why he needs it. Larson says the main reason is to give him a chance to establish himself outside the family, and that it's so his siblings cannot do anything to him. Cassin drinks his tea, then says having your siblings as enemies must be sad. Larson says that's just how it is, and even when he has to go back to his family he and Cassin will remain friends. Cassin says of course, and they shake hands with each other. Then we hear Hira says she'll help, but Soso says she'll be fine on her own, and that Hira isn't her maid. Hira says she can be if she wants, and Soso says no, she doesn't need her since she's better at organizing than she is. Hira realizes she's right. Soso then asks if she think they can remain this close once they are back in the main residence. Hira says she's unsure, and Soso says it would be difficult. Hira then notices Larson's presence and Soso asks if she's coming. She says yes, Soso tells her that Larson would like Hira if she continued acting this way. Hira says she cannot do that for her sake, and also for his. Then she vanishes. Larson knocks on the door, he calls for his mother, reminding her they are leaving tomorrow. He tells her he'll be seeing father first thing when they are back, and he'd like for her to go with him. She's surprised and starts to shake in fear trying to utter any form of excuse, but Larson says it's okay, and he will protect her. She begins to cry, and he says he has a favor to ask her. The good old window appears saying a variable affecting the story has occurred. After a bit, the rain lets up and we see Soso smiling, she calls out for Hira, who appears from invisibility. Soso tells her she's glad they became friends, and she tells Hira about Larson asking her to go see the patriarch. He no longer wants her to live in hiding, and she's not sure what is right and she's been thinking she is okay, since where she is from is inferior so she cannot support Larson. As every single action and step she takes will be observed and can be used as a weapon against Larson. But Larson asks that she pay no mind, and that she should do whatever she wants as he can handle the consequences. So she came to a decision. She is going to support Larson, Hira is surprised. Soso says that she thought she wasn't capable, 
But she believes she is. She's been hiding because she was afraid of hurting Larson. But she's sure the rest have found ways to harass him anyways, and she understands that Larson will find his own path. So it won't be helpful to him for her to keep hiding. Hira is impressed by Soso, she has no power or any unique skills, or even from a renowned family. But she is so heavily motivated. Hira says that she knows why the patriarch loves her the most. Then she vanishes without hearing a reply, Soso looks around for her and we see that Hira is scared, of having judged Soso. She wonders why she did such a thing, and if people found out what she said then she might have been killed, and she wonders when she became so soft. It cuts to the next day with Larson telling Magner he'll see him later, Magner barks at him. Hampton is also here, Manger says not to send any letters or nothing, since he doesn't want any rumors. And not even to tell people he taught him, Larson says okay and he'll send him letters, Magner asks if he's even listening. And just like that they begin to head back to the Maiden family residence. Inside the wagon Larson looks extremely serious about heading back. Magner watches him leave and says he probably won't send any letters. Larson wonders what mage they'll have waiting for him at the teleportation gate. They eventually make their way to the gate, and Larson asks Hira where the mage that is meant to be waiting is. Then we see a familiar figure appear, Larson is surprised to see that it is Evian. Larson says it had to be the White Witch, and tells her it's been a while, Larson assumes she's here to keep security tight. Then Evian asks if she can gift him some Grey Earl tea. He says alright, but Hira thinks about how Larson doesn't like Earl Grey, and wonders why he's drinking it. Evian says since he's back, then stops herself from saying chocolate and asks him to visit the library often. He says okay, then asks if they should get going now. Hira wonders if chocolate is a secret code, but that's just like her to be suspicious. They go into the gate, and are surrounded by ugly-ass giant fish. That for some reason are making grunting sounds, Evian says they'll be there soon. And Larson is blinded by a bright light, and they finally make it to the other side. Hamptop puked, Evian tells him they already have a carriage for him, and he thanks her. Then asks Soso if she's ready to go, we see her shaking, but she quells it and says yes. At the main building there are whispers of Soso returning. And the maids wonder how she's going to deal with the other wives' anger, and that something must be wrong with her. We hear Larson's father asking if this was his doing, and Larson is fighting back the feeling of passing out from his father's pressure. He tells his dad that it's the only way to save his mother, and for her to be safe, and he knows he wants it too. Decatra asks why he thinks that, Larson says it's because spouses should love each other, then asks if he doesn't love his mother. Decatra is stunlocked while staring at Soso, then asks how her being here is safe for her. Larson says because it's time that she no longer has to hide. He's focused on hiding her from everyone for her safety. And he's learned that peace earned from cowardice isn't real peace, if he doesn't have the power to subjugate others then there's no point. Decatra says he's correct, and then realizes that the method he used to protect Soso was cowardly, the thing he hates the most. Larson says he's sure there was no other choice since he was just a powerless child, Decatra instantly agrees with him. Then Soso speaks up saying she wants power, she's got neither the background nor power to protect Larson. And the only power she has is Decatra, she begins to tear up. Larson asks if this is enough, saying he is the strongest person in the world after all. It cuts to later that night, with Decatra asking Senken what he thinks. He says he didn't think Decatra would worry about this kind of stuff, Decatra asks him for advice as a friend. Senken replies that he once told him when they were younger that he should live in the present rather than worrying of the future. Decatra asks if he really said that. Senken says he's lived by those words, and that's why he stayed with him until now. The younger Decatra had no fear when making decisions, he trusted and respected all of the choices made. And he will continue to do so, Decatra smiles says he appreciates it. Senken says before he met Lyle, he was full of ambitions and goals. But as he knows, she left the world a year ago due to an unknown disease. His life after meeting her, became her. She filled his world and there are many things he regrets now she is gone. All the times he didn't focus on the present, if he had been in the present more than the past, he'd have regretted a lot less. He tells Decatra he wants his world to be a little warmer. Back inside the autumn mansion, Hira is asleep in her bed, then notices someone's presence. She sits up and looks over, then we see her walking into Larson's room after having gotten dressed. She stares at in the bed, then throws a dagger directly to where he is sleeping. It stabs something above him, causing blood to splurt. We hear Senken telling her she's as skilled as ever. He says he infiltrated as stealthily as possible. Hira asks what brings him here, 
he says he is going to take Larson away. She asks on whose orders, he tells her Decatra asked for it. She sounds inquisitive, he asks her if he'd joke about this. She asks why at this hour, he says it's just orders. She says she'll go with N, and he says okay. Then he says he cannot get used to her appearance, saying she could be his daughter. She doesn't reply, and he tells her not to stab him in the back as it would hurt. Then he reminds her he had got a scar from saving her, and then they are summoned to Decatra. Who says well done, then asks why Hira is here. She says to ensure his safety. Decatra says that she trusts Senk in the most though. She says yeah, but she doesn't think personal opinions should affect work. He says she's right, and he'll proceed with the magic ritual. Larson then asks if he can get up now, and we learn he's been faking asleep. He then asks his dad what he's doing to him. Decatra says their family is knowledgeable in many rituals, among them is the physical strengthening magic. Now he's going to engrave the Decatra ritual into his arm. Larson thinks about how it must be impressive to be named after him, then asks what it is. Decatra doesn't answer, and instead says any of the other kids would accept it instantly. Larson says the time and place aren't normal. Since his heavenly eye cannot analyze it. He also doesn't get why it's being done so late at night. Decatra says he likes that about Larson, but his favoritism can be a poison. Larson again asks why he's doing it, and Decatra says he saw the present in him. Larson feels a strong pressure on his body, specifically his arm, he stops himself from screaming, as it feels like he's being stabbed in the arm. Decatra compliments him, then we see a red tattoo on Larson's arm. Decatra says it'll be useful to him, Larson asks how, but begins to pass out as he's told he'll find out. Decatra says he's surprised he didn't scream, since the pain was quite intense. While Larson may be weak now, he knows his future is worth it. The next day we hear Ludia calling out to him, and Larson sees that she's on top of him, like a cat. She starts saying that she's hungry, we learn that Ivelia brought her here, and she keeps calling her a witch. Ivelia loves the nickname, then Ludia tells Larson she was forced to wake up early. He starts to think about the ritual, and realizes it's not on his arm anymore. Ivelia tells Ludia to stop annoying him, and pulls her away. Ludia grabs onto the sheet saying she's being harassed. Ivelia then asks when he'll be leaving for his pilgrimage, he says he'll be leaving in three days. She says she's sure her mother will be worried about her, it surprises him she called Soso his mother. And she asks why he's so surprised. He tells her he's misunderstood her is all, she says that she's unsure why he's misunderstood her. But she hopes he sees the truth. While they are having his conversation Ludia is going Super Saiyan. And she sends out a giant fire serpent to attack Ivelia, but it just gets swatted away like a bug. Ivelia tells Larson he passed her test, she tested him as the oldest daughter in the family, now she will reward him as his sister. He realizes she must mean the white tiger, she asks him to get up from bed. And he does, she puts a magic circle under him. And a robe spawns on him, he asks if it's her gift, she says yes. We learn it's a legendary item. It is also the robe that Ivelia used to wear, the white dragon scale robe. He knows it saved her life multiple times, and says it's the best gift he could have gotten. She tells him it's gotten a lot weaker than when she used to wear it. She says just once it'll allow him to kill a mage that is below 6th circle. Which is insane to him since it's an unreachable realm without talent, and he's sure he'll have to use it one day. He thanks her, and she says that as his sister she hopes he comes back safely, but as the maiden's oldest daughter, he needs to come back much stronger. He says yes, and we see Ludia being dragged away. Ivelia is happy with having been able to talk to him again, then three days later we see Hampton, and he's crying again. He tells Larson he got all the antidotes he needed, along with descriptions of each. Hira tells Larson to become stronger, he tells her to take care of his mother. Then he thanks Evian for coming to see him off too, she says of course and puts something into his hand. He looks down to see a piece of chocolate. He guesses this is what she thinks the best gift for him is. Larson says he'll see them all later. And looks up at the family house saying as stated by the familial rules, he intends to leave for his pilgrimage. As he says this he sees fire in the sky, then it crashes in front of him. It's of course Ludia, who asks if she's late. Then she hands him a letter from Ivelia, in the letter it says that she'd like to keep teaching Ludia, but it's at a stage that she should explore and spend more time with her friend. Larson says it makes sense, then asks if she wants to go with him. She says yes, and he says it's finally time to move forward. This time, down the path to savior. Later in the night, Ludia begins to sniff at Larson. 
He asks her what it is, she keeps sniffing and says his clothes smell like that witch. He says he didn't notice, and then she says it's just like he said. We see an inn called the Fat Cat, he explains there are three inns in the middle of the Savior Street. The Fat Cat, with the cute sign, is run by an organization called the Night Sound. Larson says none of this really matters, but he opens the door saying he's on his pilgrimage and wants to rest here tonight. The night's sound is related to Decatra, they have a secret link to the maidens. The innkeeper tells him how much it would be for a night and for meals. Along with when check out is, since they don't have that many guests. The man's name is Brig, he is an informant. Larson asks Brig if he will guide them to their rooms, while Ludia pets the kitties. Brig tells him that their rooms are upstairs, to the right, and it's the biggest room. Larson realizes he won't guide them himself, then says it's really hot here. Brig laughs, says he's saying random things and that it's cold. Larson then asks what kind of food he should eat on a hot day like this, Brig is confused still, then Larson says some beer and two pieces of pizza would be the best. Brig says he'll prepare it all for breakfast tomorrow, but then he says that Larson is too young for beer. Larson says he guesses so, and he'll just play with the cats. And that this is part of the night's sound password. When it's a hot day, say it's cold, cold say it's hot. And if er a child ask for beer, an adult ask for candy. This contradicting statement is the passcode here, in return for the night's sound being active in the maiden family, disciples of the family who are on pilgrimage are able to enjoy certain benefits. Briggs says they have two cats here. One is Hobbs, the skinny one and then Valve the chonky one. Then he asks which he'd like to play with, Larson says he'd play with Valve. Briggs says that it might be easier to play with Hobbs. But thinks to himself how picking Valve means he wants money, and he wonders why Larson just didn't ask his family for money instead. Larson says he'd rather pick Valve. He thinks about how it's because only the mother's side can receive support in the maintenance, and it's a shame to lose the artifact here, but he needs money. And by helping him the night's sound secret relationship with the maidens will come to an end, also meaning this inn will be shut down. It cuts to later with Senken having explained the situation to Decatra. And Decatra wonders how Larson knew about it, Senken says he got the information from the library. Decatra asks if he truly thinks he found it in the books. Senken suggests Evian helped him, and they talk about how the librarians are meant to remain neutral. But that Evian seems to like Larson, Decatra says none of the other kids would stop by an inn like the fat cat, nor would they read in the library. Senken asks if he planned all of this for Larson. He replies saying they all had the opportunity. Senken says he's clearly having fun, Decatra says that only Larson took the chance he created, and acknowledges today is the last day the fat cat will operate. The next morning, Larson says he slept really well. Then he wakes up and turns into an anime girl after seeing all of the gold around him. Since it's enough for him to live a life of luxury for two years. Ludia also wakes up, asking when breakfast is. She says she dreamed about cats, he tells her it's because they are in the fat cat inn. Larson realizes that there were times when Ludia's dreams were actually prophecies, and an ambush would happen after her dreams, which made Cassin stay on edge. The Heavenly Eye is also sending him a warning, something is going to happen soon. Larson calls out to her, then tells her to set fire to the inn as soon as possible. We see smoke in the woods, and like he said she set the inn on fire. Outside their room we see a group of a, uh, oddly dressed people. The clansmen lean up against the door, saying they'll go in now but gets interrupted by a warm hello from Larson, this surprises the group then another one in the back tells them all to prepare for battle. And since Larson is only a second circle they can body him, Larson says that they are trying to attack him despite knowing who he is. And that they are strong, he'd not have survived if it weren't for the Sade's training. It's good for him that they don't know what happened at the Shades, despite the fact they are an information organization. He goes into his ultra instinct mode, saying it's time to finish this. They quickly realize they don goofed as his mana is much greater than a second circles. They quickly try to deploy defensive magic and make some distance, but they are too damn slow as Larson instantly closes the gap taking some of them out immediately. The rest take this chance to cast some offensive magic together, saying even a maiden would die to this. They shoot out three flame dragons directly at Larson saying they'll follow him to hell. Larson realizes this much mana is a lot, but it's no problem as he is grail here to consume it up. As their fire attack lands they all watch, and wonder what happened to him. But then are surprised. Larson's blitz timer begins to increase, and he says he is full of mana. He says he was going to play with Valve, but this is okay with him too. Since he's at his peak right now, then it jumps to a bit later, and we hear Decatra saying to take the blindfold off him, 
and they do so. We see Brig is tied up, and is being questioned on why he attacked Larson. We see his pinky is broken, and he says that his group thought they'd be able to continue working if they got rid of him. Decatra says that's strange, since he permitted the business operation. And we get a flashback to his conversation with Senkin, and him saying that he'll change his mind. So that the fat cat can continue to run. Briggs says he's an information broker, and he thought that Decatra wanted him to find out what was going on with the seventh young master. We get a flashback to Larson saying he won't ask who they are, but this place is under the Maiden's family jurisdiction, and if a fire made by magic spreads. The Maiden family will dispatch a magic investigation squad and that the Maiden family doesn't care about what he does. Then he rips Briggs' mask off, saying that the moment anyone lays a finger on a Mayon in front of their magic investigation squad, they'll be arrested. Larson says that Briggs will be punished for attacking him. Larson says that if Briggs was actually trying to kill him, then Briggs would be dead. Larson then stretches his hand toward him, and zaps him with fighting spirit, which is how he broke his pinky. Larson tells Ludia it's time to go, Briggs starts to tear up since his mana won't replenish. Flashback ends, Decatra says it was a good present. Then asks if they were the ones who set fire to the inn. Briggs lowers his head, saying no, and that the young lady with the seventh young master did it. Which of course we know he means Ludia. Decatra says that Larson not only took care of his ambushers, but also caused the investigation squad to be dispatched. He went above and beyond showing what he's capable of, none of his sisters have even had that much confidence, he truly lives up to the maiden name. He then tells Briggs to go, and he approves of him continuing his business. He says as a reward for showing how competent he is he will fix his finger. Briggs tells him it's nothing to worry about, and Decatra just cuts it off. Briggs realizes that he couldn't even react to it, so if it was his neck he'd be dead. So he's gotta get out of here quickly. He finally gets to leave, and sees his boys waiting with Valve and Hobbs. They are all relieved, and Briggs realizes he's gotten off easy. Let's hope they change their costume design, if they reappear. It cuts back to Larson and Ludia grilling fish, and she asks him where they are headed to. He's surprised she's only asking now, and she says it's because her brain is smooth. He tells her they are going to Holon, and she asks if he means the Holy Empire. He says yes, and asks her if she knows about it. She says she read it in a book, I'm just surprised she can read. Then she asks why they are going there, he tells her there's just a lot of things there. He thinks about how the things he created when he was Sungmin are there, and he'd like to get them before Kassin does. He asks if she's ready to go, and mentions how there are three paths, he uses heavenly eye and looks closely at the sign to reveal some words underneath. He then asks Ludia if she can see them, she says yes and reads out the Holy Empire Holon. Okay she can read my bad, and he asks about the bottom of the sign, she say there's nothing there. Larson thinks about it a bit, and says back when he followed Magner to look for the chestplate, it's the same thing he saw back then. Something about descendants, Grail then pops up saying he's draining all of his mana, but he won't say anything if he's praised. He then compliments Grail, and begins to touch the sign to expand the message that's on the bottom. It mentions how the one to attain their items will get the thousand-year chestplate, or if they have a specific item, or possess the heavenly eye. Ludia can also see the words now. Then a man suddenly appears saying he'll introduce himself, and that his name is Kirtle, and he says it's nice to meet his descendant. Of course we know who Kirtle is from the previous part. Ludia says she can't smell or touch him, then Grail starts to get pissed and barks at Kirtle. Saying just when he was forgetting him. He appears again. Larson reminds Grail that he isn't actually there. Kirtle says he is in a slumber within the Northern Sea. Larson, being the world's creator, understands that it's at the end of the world's northern region. A land so cold that no human can live there. Not even the maidens could conquer the Northern Sea. Kirtle says he hopes his descendant can wake him up, but if he doesn't, then it's just his fate. For the sake of the future, he's decided to seal himself in the Northern Sea. And to break his seal, there are many items he prepared but that he will need to fulfill two conditions to become his descendant. The first is to have the heavenly eye, which he does. And the second is the holy grail, which he also has. Larson nervously laughs, and Kirtle says to go to Heron if the fire clan is still around, Ludia realizes he means her family. And Kirtle says winning the hearts of the fire clan is key, and if he's unable to establish a contract of fire he won't be able to awaken grail. And that he needs to find the holy grail and come back, then Kirtle vanishes. Ludia says he's gone, and then Larson wonders if he just needs to infuse his mana into the sign. He begins to do that, and Kirtle appears again saying he's been waiting for his descendant. Then he's surprised he has the Holy Grail, 
saying he must have gone through a tough journey to obtain it. Larson sarcastically says it was rough. It jumps to them on a bird and Ludia saying they are almost to the unknown cliff. Larson says okay, then looks down at the item in his hand. Then flashbacks to Kirtle saying he's on the path of a great mage, and since he's passed the first test he will make arrangements for him, and if he grows by following the path he's laid out he will find all of the truths. The item is a tooth, specifically the canine of allegiance from the Golden Tiger tribe. Flashback ends, he tells Ludia it's time to go, and she thanks the big bird. Then they jump off and begin to use their magic to glide downward. Larson uses the wind attribute and touches the ground, Ludia is asking if they can do it again since it was so fun. He says there's no time, and she asks why they are here. He tells her they are going to find the Crow clan, Ludia starts throwing shade at them saying that her dad says they are cowards that can't do anything. She asks how he's going to find them, then he pulls out a bag saying he'll use this. He starts to leave a trail of golden coins behind as they walk. Ludia says it's a waste of money, and he tells her it's just one grand each time. And since he has 300 million it's fine, the coins begin to be picked up behind them. Larson says it's good they are picking them up, but they are still on guard. We learn the Crow clan dislikes humans since a long time ago their wings were treated as a luxury item. There are still traces of that at some people's homes, so as a survival strategy their descendants had the fear of humans built into their DNA. A whole day goes by, we see Ludia laying down saying he's wasting his time. He asks if that's a problem, she says no since she likes being lazy, she'd like to do this forever. Larson tells her it'll take a bit more time, so keep lazing around. Then a bit later see she says it's just as he said, we see the Crow clan kneeling in front of him asking if he has more coins. They finally drop their guard, Ludia is happy the birds are talking to them. Larson says he has a lot of gold, and they ask for more than begin to fight over it, they keep begging to him. So he gives them more, they stop fighting and begin to ask how they can repay this favor. He pulls out the canine of allegiance, asking if they are familiar with it. They start going crazy, Ludia asks why they are acting like this. Larson says it's because they know the owner of the canine. We learn that when he wrote the Crow clan's background he saw an article about crows repaying people for giving them stuff. So he decided to make it part of the setting, so their number one priority is repaying favors. The crows start to talk about how it's from the tiger clan, and one of them ate their family. But they will repay the favor, they start chanting this, and Ludia says they are so nice. Larson just thinks it's crazy, then one of the crows introduce himself as Tuma. Tuma says he knows where the tigers are, which Larson explains he means the Golden Tiger tribe, they have a very small population. But they are so strong they do not need a large group, if they had a larger population they'd for sure rule the continent. Tuma starts to cry saying shitty tiger bad, eats us. Larson realizes they prey on those weaker than them, and to be safe tells Ludia to wait here. She says she wants to meet the tigers, but she'll listen to his request. He says okay, then tells Tuma to lead the way. Tuma is obviously terrified, so Larson hands him a gold coin. And completely 180s his personality. It jumps back to the Grandel family, and Magner is complaining that his brother keeps nagging him for doing something. Vela Tutor sighs, and Magner continues saying that they had it coming since they asked for Rosalind to be their concubine. Turns out Vela Tutor is annoyed that Magner killed them instantly, rather than torturing them first. Magner says sending them off painlessly is humane. Vela Duter laughs saying that only applies to humans. Magner replies saying that others heard that it would cause trouble. Since Vela Tutor is considered a saint, and highly benevolent. He smirks, saying whatever and they should go back to their original conversation. Then asks how much he taught Larson. Magner thinks about it, then says he taught him four of the basic wills, and three of their basic martial arts. But anyone can find that much out, but Larson has a truth that is much more important than that. Vela Tutor asks what he means, Magner tells him that Larson absorbed his fighting spirit. Vela Tutor says that's not possible, since fighting spirit and mana are different, so how can they utilize both? Magner says currently, it's closer to an imitation of it. But his body can withstand both, Vela Tutor says if this causes something bad to happen to the family. Magner cuts him off, saying he will take full responsibility. And then as Larson's teacher he will kill him himself. Then it cuts back to Tuma and Larson continuing to walk away from the tent. Ludia sits at the tent, and thinks about how Ivelia said she'd only be a burden to Larson. Since she's weak, and Ivelia doesn't want to let any harm come to a maiden. Ludia says she knows that she's weak, she really wanted to go with Larson. 
but she understands that she needs to become stronger to be able to stand side by side with him. We see a fire from where she was, Larson spots it too. Chuma asks what's wrong, and he says nothing. A window appears saying Ludia is determined to become strong, and the god of fire looks kindly at Ludia. This surprises Larson, since Phonix was a transcendental being he created. The tribe of fire that was powerful enough to dominate the entire continent. But the more power Phoenix consumed, the weaker the tribe became. And he didn't appear much in the story since he wasn't created to do anything directly, Cassin wasn't affected by Phoenix in the past, so the only option is that the heavenly eye he has, is inherently different than Cassin's. Tuma then freaks out over the smell, and tells Larson he's repaid his debts and flies away. Larson thanks Tuma for bringing him here, we see a deer's corpse, and a girl sitting beside it. Larson says he can sense how strong she is. The girl looks up and sees him, he tells her he's come to meet the Golden Tiger tribe. She says she has no business with children, and she'll let him live so next time to come with an adult. He says to wait and he has a question to ask. He debates how to show her the canine of allegiance, and since she won't talk to him unless she deems him worthy. He doesn't think showing her will do anything. Larson's done something to piss her off, and she says she's changed her mind on letting him live. And her body begins to morph into that of a tiger, Larson wonder why she's getting larger, she says she's going to eat him now. Larson starts to get a little nervous due to the pressure she's emanating, but says he thought this might happen, and he puts his hands up saying there's no way it would go smoothly. He activates flow slowly, as she runs in at him. He dodges an attack saying it's nothing compared to Magner, and the girl says that's impressive, but says he cannot dodge forever. Larson says she's right the longer it goes the worse it'll be. So to gain her acknowledgement, he needs to show her everything he's got. He activates his fighting spirit and their fists collide. She is surprised then Larson takes the chance to create distance. She says his technique is quite strange, asking if he's from a martial arts family. Larson is just thinking about how she's too damn strong, even Cassin wouldn't have been able to eat that like it was nothing. But now he's found her weakness, he activates his wind attribute then says he's won this fight. She watches as he disappears, but we know he's just dashing directly towards her, she swings at him saying he'll die here. But of course he's too quick, so he dodges it and she feels something behind her. We see he's grabbing her tail, and she starts to sweat saying if he lets go then she'll spare his life. Larson says the tribe's weakness is their tail, she's got the same weakness as a Saiyan, they even cut their tails off when they are young. He squeezes her tail and she starts to cry saying that she's lost so just let go. He does that, asking if she acknowledges him. She leaps away saying she let her guard down, but that it was indeed her fault. He asks if she'll talk, and she starts to lick her lips saying she should just kill him, why does she need to talk? Larson says someone from her tribe with honor wouldn't do that. She wonders where such a monster came from, and how he knows so much about her tribe. She introduces herself as Morang. With a pout on her face, she asks what he wants to talk about. He pulls out the canine of allegiance, asking what she knows about it. She instantly recognizes it, saying it's Tatanka's canine, which we learn is a relic left behind by the hero of the Golden Tiger tribe from a long time ago. And a treasure they've been searching for. Morang says she isn't sure if it's true or not. And she's curious as to how she knew it was Tatanka's canine without having seen it. He asks her what she would have done if he just showed it out of nowhere, and she asks what kind of person he thinks she is. She says she would have eaten him and taken it. He thanks himself for fighting back, then asks why she wants it. She says it's because you can enter the Golden Tiger tribe's village with it. Larson says they are meant to be independent creatures, so it doesn't make sense. He asks why they made a village, Morang says it's due to a hunter, she killed any Golden Tiger member she saw. Of course it's Ivelia, Morang says that the entire Golden Tiger tribe could have been wiped out if they didn't get together. Which is why they decided to leave together, they formed a group so they could avoid Ivelia. Larson nervously sweats, Morang continues by saying Ivelia wasn't crazy, and she was provoked first. The real problem was the woman who came after her, he asks Morang who. She says Persia. Persia took it personal that Ivelia killed 30 and was praised a hero, so she decided to kill 100. Larson tries his best not to say anything, and Morang says that in order to fight back against the crazy woman, the elders made a few more villages. But they were all slaughtered and now are left with a single village, Morang flashbacks to when she was just a cub standing before Persia. And Persia smiled while asking if she knew why they were being hunted, and that it's because they are weak. So when she grows up she can find her if she has problems, although she'll still be weaker than her, 
Then she cut her eye which is how she got her scar. All of the adults died in the village that day, which is why she still has her tail. Meringue looks sad, and says she doesn't hold rage, but that the adults were weak which lead to their deaths. Larson asks why she cannot enter the village without the canine, Meringue says it's because she's weak. She was born much weaker than normal golden tigers, and they disregard those who fall behind. Larson asks when Ivelia hunted the tigers, and she says six years ago. Then Larson asks how old Morang is, and she says she's five. Larson is surprised asking why she called him a kid, she asks what he's talking about. He thinks that obviously their age is counted differently, but this is odd. He confirms that he can enter her village now. She says it isn't her village, since she doesn't live there. Then the canine of Allegiance name changes, and says that he must place it on the Golden Tiger tribe's altar. He asks if he can go with her, she agrees but warns him it might not go well, as they might just beat her up and kick her out. Same with him. He says what about the canine, and she says they can just take it from him. But she'll guide him there if he wants to go. He thinks about how she's a monster that can easily block his fighting spirit, but yet the others still consider her weak and lacking. He realizes he needs to do this if he wants to reach his sister's age, he then asks where it is. She says the Dragon Mountain ranges, then it cuts to him telling Ludia, and we learn her hometown of Heron is there. Ludia asks if she can touch Morang's tail, and Morang asks if she can eat her, Larson tells her absolutely not. It jumps again tonight and we hear something drop outside their tent. They open it to see Morang saying she brought meat for them to eat. They start cooking it up, and we learn Morang hates portal gates so they are walking there, but it's not bad as the atmosphere seems good with, Morang and Ludia getting along. After cooking it, Morang explains that the meat of this boar is really soft. Ludia says it melts in her mouth, Larson then says he's heard the Golden Tiger tribe aren't picky eaters. She says as if, and that they are all picky. Also, the food in his pocket dimension smells weird. Morang then says she enjoys eating humans the most, he asks why she's saying that then asks if tiger meat tastes good. She quickly says no, and that it's too tough. She's a damn cannibal. They get to a sign post and then Ludia asks if she can catch up with them after visiting her dad. Larson tells her to wait at her village, she asks what he's going to do. He says he'll meet with the tiger tribe, she looks disappointed then asks if it's because she's weak. He's surprised, and thinks while she is talented she is indeed too weak for the tiger tribe. He doesn't say it, then she begins to walk off saying that she just needs to talk to her dad if she wants to become strong. And then she says she'll become strong enough to protect him, as she's his contractor of fire. He tells her he'll try not to be late, and thinks how it's probably the best for Ludia. And he'll also become stronger from Kirtle's assignment. Meringue starts sniffing, then tells Larson that it must be close by. Grail says he hates it here, and he slept here for a thousand years, and was sealed here. Larson says he understands that, but wonders why Morang is digging into the ground. Grail says she probably doesn't know the trigger word to get into the village. He wonders why she looks so happy, then a man appears behind them asking if they are a golden tiger. Larson turns around to see a tall man. Morang is completely paralyzed in fear, Larson says he must be the real deal after seeing her reaction. We know she's been harassed by the other tribe members, and he wonders why she wanted to go to the village, even though she's so scared. The man says that Larson isn't part of the tribe, so how does he have to tank his canine? He says Kirtle told him to come. The man says he's never heard of that name before. Larson then introduces himself as Larson Maiden. Morang is also smooth-brained and starts thinking about the last name. Larson says he's related to Ivelia and Persia Maiden, and he's sure to recognize those two names. The man is angry as hell, but Morang is just shocked by this. Larson says it'll take time to get acknowledged by the entire Tiger tribe, so he'll just get this started already. Morang starts to also get mad, and calls Larson a bastard. Asking how dare he deceive her, she also says he'll eat her. The other Tiger gets pissed at her for leading a maiden to their front door, she tries her best to explain that she had no idea about this and begins to tear up telling Laren to explain to him. Larson says she just threatened to eat him, and she says she can do it after. The man bears his teeth, and begins to shake saying they will die fighting him. Larson tells him he came to prevent that, and to fix the mistake his sisters made. The man transforms asking if he's really meant to believe that, asking how he's meant to right their wrongs. Larson says he will offer Tutanka's canine to the altar, and he will inherit Tutanka and Kirtle's wills so he can put an end to the maiden's meaningless murder. The man asks if he's truly meant to believe it, Larson says to let the altar judge him. 
The man says his hands will judge him before then, Larson says it surely isn't too late to judge if the canine is fake or not. Another man appears, and is missing his leg. Larson says his name is Elder Bakuya. The man asks how he knows his name, he only knows because of the heavenly eye. Larson says the great sage Kirtle told him, Bakuya says the name and says he cannot recall it. Larson says he looked into the future, and in that future the maidens caused mayhem in the world. And he's inherited his will and was born with the fate of stopping his siblings. Bakuya is excited about this, and says he isn't sure about Kirtle. But he knows of the old legends from the tiger tribe. We learn the younger generations don't care for it, but the legend of Tutanka is about him ripping out his own canine, and swearing he would protect the tribe's land and their people. And that he made an altar that would fit his canine. In the future when his canine and altar meet again the great hero Tutanka will appear once more. Larson is confused that Tutanka had comrades when the golden tigers hunt individually, and asks Morang if she agrees. She's saying maybe. Larson thinks about how Tutanka and his canine are reacting, and that means there is magic involved with this. The Golden Tiger tribe doesn't know how to handle magic properly, so how could a chief of the Golden Tiger cast magic? And it's also strange that none of them found it strange in the first place. Larson tells Bakuya he's been here before long ago due to the wise sage Kirtle. Bakuya sniffs saying he does indeed smell it on him. Larson says he's curious, then asks why Persia cannot find them since she could easily detect the barrier here. Bakuya doesn't have an actual answer and then starts to wonder why he didn't notice this before. Larson says that it's all due to the great sage Kirtle. They ask what his relationship with the Golden Tiger tribe was. Larson thinks how Tutanka wasn't someone who dominated the world, and if you replace his name with Kirtle's it all makes sense, but would they even understand what he's talking about? Larson just tells them that Kirtle is the one who hypnotized their bloodlines, and is the one who left the canine behind. Morang asks why he hypnotized them, Larson says that's what Tutanka wanted. Bakuya extends his hand outward, complimenting how clever he is and says he'll guide him to the village. Larson smirks saying he's past the first level, then shakes his hand. As they begin to walk to the village, Morang just watches until he tells her to join them. They end up making it to a waterfall, and Bakuya says something in enchantment table. Larson sees the space and time around them begin to warp and distort. He starts to feel dizzy, a lot worse than when he goes into a warp gate. But he tries to not show any weakness so they don't eat him, they finally make it and it looks like Dune. Larson looks around and some members of the tribe ask what a human is doing here. Bakuya tells them he brought Tutanka's canine. He begins to cry saying that Tutanka is finally saving them, and wonders what he's prepared for their tribe. Morang looks around the village and is really happy to have finally made it to the village. The other tribe members say they can smell Tutanka, and Bakuya realizes that none of them have met Tut before so this must be the hypnosis in their bloodline. They make it to where the altar is. Bakuya tells him to head up the stairs and put the canine into the hole, and if someone unqualified tries it they will die from lightning. Larson says he's never heard of that before, but the status window shows he's got the plot armor already. And if someone who didn't meet Kirtle tried they'd have just died from a skill, Larson says the name is too long and I agree. Bakuya asks if he's scared, he says not at all and asks if he should begin. He walks up the stairs toward the altar, and says he can feel magic from it, and says there shouldn't be a problem since Kirtle gave it to him. He puts the canine onto the altar. It begins to light up with a blue hue, Larson realizes something's activated. The tribe members all start to chant Tut's name. And he appears before them in a hologram, of course we all recognize that it's just Kirtle when he was younger. He says successor, you've brought the Holy Grail. And since he's brought Grail with him, he will bestow onto him a gift. A jewel appears, and it flies past Larson, smacking Grail. Grail starts to panic saying his handsome face is ruined now. Kirtle says he's sure Pookie is crying about the pain right now, Larson wonders why his nickname is Pookie. Grail says he isn't Pookie but the Great, and gets interrupted by Kirtle just being one step ahead. Kirtle says if his prediction is correct, then he's sure his successor is walking the path of a mage, but also not at the same time. Larson says he must mean the fighting technique. Kirtle says no matter how talented one is, there's no booty that can embrace infinite power. This problem is why he thought of Grail, and in putting an attribute not to the body, but something else. That is what Grail's real role is. Larson thinks about how in the novel when Cassin had Grail it wasn't an attribute storage. And it's more useful now than it was in the story, Larson asks Grail what attribute he can use. Grail says he can use all of them due to the attribute stone he just received. 
Kirtle chimes in saying the first attribute should have been fire, and he's sure that he'll learn to utilize attribute magic more in the future. But it's important to understand that because of the attribute being melted into Grail, others will never find out about it, and being able to hide this will be useful. If he continues to follow in Kirtle's footsteps he'll learn many things, and if possible he should follow the footsteps of his beloved friend too. He vanishes, leaving Larson wondering who the friend is. Larson says Grail looks disappointed, he starts to yap and he calls him Pookie. Grail really likes the nickname. Then the earth begins to shake, and Larson realizes that the Atlar is actually breaking apart. And he begins to fall down, he uses the wind attribute to safely land, saying that scared him. Then he sees all of the tribe members in their tiger forms, but they are frozen in place. Bakuya sighs, and changes back saying when the altar broke. So did their constraints? Larson asks what he means. Bakuya says that the tiger tribe was strong enough to dominate the world, but when Tut disappeared God's constraint began to tighten on them. But now that constraint has been removed, the tribe begin to glow golden. The barrier also begins to disappear as time and space begin to change. Bakuya says even with the constraint gone, their tribe is incomplete. Larson asks why that is, Bakuya tells him it's due to them not having tails. But of course we know a specific tiger girl who has her tail. And the rest realize it too. Bakuya explains that there was a king in the tribe, it was symbolic. But every single king was actually a female, and that it's matriarchal. He tells Morang that she is fit to be their ruler, and it seems like the constraint was really intense on her. She says she's full of power. Larson pieces it together the reason she was weaker than the others was due to taking the brunt of the constraint. Due to her family being slaughtered by Persia and her not having her tail cut off she was shunned. Which led to them eventually meeting, and for it all to be a coincidence is just too much. Kirtle must be in control of all of this. The tribe members all begin to greet Larson with their names, swearing absolute cooperation with him for freeing them from the gods' constraint. Too many names to say, even Morang says her name and swears cooperation. The window appears saying the tiger tribe made an oath of loyalty, so now he has them as an ally. He smiles since this is what Kirtle wanted to give him, and now with the constraint gone they are incredibly strong. The tribe held a feast and celebrations, as after it ends they will all head their separate ways, they will no longer need to live together, they can go back to living individually. They cannot beat his sisters, but they can run for sure. Larson asks Morang why she hasn't left yet. She tells him that she was originally headed to Heron. He asks why, she absolutely just made it up. And quickly says he must be bored on his own, he tells her to just do as she wants. Then they notice that there is a giant fire from Heron. Larson recognizes the fire isn't normal, and that it's from Persia. He begins to get worried as Ludia is in Heron currently, and if she meets Persia it will be bad. He activates his wind attribute saying there's no time to waste and dashes off towards the town. Hoping nothing has happened yet. Morang is surprised, and says it's a familiar but terrifying feeling she has as she stares at the giant fire. Larson makes it to the village, and sees it on fire. He looks around, and a citizen runs up to him saying they need help. He asks what happened, then she says Persia, but all of the flesh on her body erupts into ash before she can say Maiden. Behind the woman's corpse he sees Ludia on the floor, and Persia standing above her. Persia starts to lick the blood on her hands, saying there he is. She says she saw Ivelia's doll so she had to have fun with her. Then says she's also Larson's toy huh? Larson ignores her comment, asking why she's here. She asks if she's not allowed, saying he can be warmer to her. Larson says the whole village smells like burning flesh, and wonders why. He recalls Ludia's excitement about going to see her clan, and Larson starts to get angry wondering why she's done this. He says if she was waiting for him she must have some business with him. She says that she wanted to see him, but he's wrong. And that she's here for Morang instead. She needs the teeth of a golden tiger. Larson asks why, Persia says it's one of her hobbies. She hasn't been detecting the tiger tribe recently. So she had some people do work for her and they said the tigers were in this area. Larson realizes she has information networks all over the world. She says since her brother was the one with the tiger how could she not come? Since he brought her here for her, she's wondered what he might want in return. And that killing the people here and burning their village is her gift to him. Morang gets some PTSD flashbacks from seeing the village on fire and drops to her knees in fear. She looks at Larson with teary eyes, asking why he lied to her. Larson tells Persia the people of Heron were innocent. Persia says that people die regardless of being innocent or guilty. Larson says the tigers are also innocent. 
and he says that she isn't just a tiger person, but her name is Meringue. She is his friend who will accompany him on his journey, and he has no intentions of handing her over. Meringue is surprised by him saying this. But Persia is just annoyed, and says it's time that she sees how strong he's gotten since last time. She forms a magic circle in her fingers, then blows it at Larson. It quickly flies right by his head, creating a massive explosion behind Larson. He is a bit afraid of how powerful the attack is, saying this is the power of a sixth circle mage. Persia says surely he knows she missed on purpose. She says she won't miss this time, she warns him if he doesn't move that he will die. She makes the circle again. Telling him if he does end up moving though, that meringue will die. She blows the magic again, and it begins to fly directly at Larson. As it gets closer he doesn't even blink. Just stares at it, then it disappears. He stares at her, and she says he knew she wouldn't harm him. He says it's because she wants to be patriarch, and he's immune to siblings during his pilgrimage. She begins to pout a little, saying this is boring. Larson smiles and goes to ask her something, and she says this will be fun then launches her whip towards the unconscious Ludia. Cutting her arm off, as it flies through the air. Persia smiles while Meringue is full of worry. Larson is shocked watching it fly, then instantly activates his blitz tactic readying himself. Persia asks if it's a magic combat skill, she says his mana increased but it won't change anything. She asks why don't they play the game they use too. She says if he makes her take one step he wins, and if he wins she will let Meringue and Ludia go. He says she better keep that promise. He rushes in at her, and she says it's time to see how strong he's gotten. She waves her arms making a wall of fire appear. She says he'll be burned to ashes if he touches it. Larson grunts and she asks what he will do. He imbues his fist with mana, and makes it the fire attribute. Then punches the wall she created. He breaks through it and starts to get close. She says he took fire into his body, then asks how he did it in such a short time. She thinks about how he sure makes things fun, so it's time to step to the next level. He grabs onto Persia and starts to squeeze her with the intention of breaking her ribs. As he squeezes he realizes she is not budging at all. She says he must have missed her quite a bit, hugging her with so much passion. She acknowledges his flame resistance, saying a normal second circle would have died on the spot. She wonders if maybe it's his robe, wondering where he got it. She says it reminds her of Ivelia, which she hates. Then she raises her hand, lifting Larson into the air, and begins to activate flame magic. Larson starts to scream in pain as it's breaking his robe and chestplate. Grail says he's at his limit too, and his body feels as if it'll burst soon. Meringue sees this and begins to shake wondering what she should do in this situation. She thinks back to her mother handing her a four-leaf clover, saying it will bring her luck. And she's sure only good things will happen to her from now on. But right after that was when Persia attacked her village killing her entire family. Her mother screams for her to run, but is beheaded by Persia's magic. Then she turned to Meringue and stared at her, Meringue begins to cry. Persia burns her clover and says the line she said before of look for her when she's stronger. Meringue is still locked up as Larson is being pressured by Persia's fire mana. She says this is what it feels like to be weak Larson. The weak always lose to the strong, they always get things taken from them without being able to do anything. Just like Meringue right now. Larson angrily tells her that any time the weak did something. The world changed, Meringue hears these words and begins to tear up. Larson tells her the fear inside her is something she needs to overcome. She resolves herself, and grabs her robe throwing it into the air. She begins to walk at Persia, realizing she needs to be the change. She transforms into a tiger, and then we see blood splatter and she's got her teeth sunk into Persia's arm, or rather she's ripped it off entirely as she dashed past Persia. Larson is freed from the magic, but is out of mana now so his ultra instinct ends. And he's glad that Meringue bit Persia's arm. Persia looks at Meringue, and smiles saying she remembers her now. And a significant change occurs in the storyline. Persia begins to laugh even with her arm being bitten off, Meringue and Larson are shocked as she just laughs away. Persia then sighs saying she's gotten so weak, but smiles saying not bad for a golden tiger. Larson feels fear as Persia says she said it before. Then snaps her fingers, and a magic circle appears below Meringue. Then it hits her causing her to scream, Persia says she warned her she'd still be weaker than her. Larson recognizes it as a fake fire, and it's her illusion magic. Persia says it was an illusion cast with the intention of killing but she's still alive. Larson realizes they are in a bad spot since she one-shot Meringue. 
Persia says she has to admit that Meringue has the potential to be his toy, since she even cut her arm off. Then she tells Larson this is her gift, and she throws her arm at Larson. He looks at it wondering how it is a gift. To a mage their arms are the most important thing after their heart, since it allows them to cast spells. He asks why she's giving it to him, and she says because he brought her fun. He tells her to just put it back on. She laughs saying that would ruin this special day, he realizes she's planning something. Then remembers that in the novel Ludia was called the Mage Slayer, but that she only had a single arm in the novel. So how was she able to become the Mage Slayer with one arm? There must be a penalty when using only one arm, due to noticing the lack of probability he unlocks the creator's privilege again. Time stops entirely as it has done before, as he's discovered a new plot hole. And as the author he needs to correct this mistake. Ludia was able to achieve the title of Mage Slayer despite a single arm. He's got to put a reason, and he says that there are two clues. He says he cannot understand why Persia is giving him one of her arms, and she let Meringue live since she genuinely is having fun. So he needs to make all of this plausible without changing the plot. So he puts the reason as that it's one of the various conditions for a flame mage's success. He made it various just in case, since he can't make them necessary. He could have putting something about making her receive a physical advantage, but it would affect the other flame type mages too. The world begins to go back to normal, so he's fixed the plot hole. Time flows again, and Persia says she had fun today. A lot more than she thought, and that Larson looks cute when he's mad. She's always ready for his challenge, she hopes that he grows stronger and doesn't forget the rage he felt today. Then she kisses him on the cheek, and says she hopes he can officially challenge her one day. But when he does that, he will need to be prepared to die. As she won't go easy like she did this time. And she can't wait to see him again. Then she vanishes into flames. Larson stand there dazed, and we see Persia teleported back to her office. Sando welcomes her back, and asks about her arm. She says it was given to Larson. Sando says she knows it's rude, then asks why she created the illusion of the citizens burning. Persia says it's fun, though it would have been more enjoyable to kill them all. Larson would end up hating her, but she wouldn't want that to happen. Back in Heron, which is still burnt to a crisp. Ludia is on her knees, saying that her dad used to like pear flowers. Because her mother liked them, and her dad always mentioned going to see her mother. But she resents Larson a bit now, since his sister killed her dad. She knows it isn't his fault, and it was hers for being weak. It's why she couldn't protect her dad, nor her arm. And that she will become strong enough to kill Persia. No, she will kill Decatra first so she can feel what she is going through now. Larson begins to feel an ominous energy from Ludia, and we see something form behind her. Even Meringue looks over at it to see a giant eye. The status window appears saying that Ludia's demon extinction eye has been opened, and her orbital healing power has activated. Larson says that in the novel Persia took Ludia's arm before they even met, and that's what led to this eye opening and her becoming the enemy to all mages. He tried to change the story and prevent it from happening, but now it's happened anyways. And if it keeps up like it is now, he will end up dying. If you've watched till the end comment, shark, to let me know. Subscribe for more videos like this, leave a like or a comment to help the channel out. Thanks for watching.